So Joseph Green is a spoken word artist, educator, and narrative disruptor with over 20 years of experience creating dialogue that's led to success in classrooms, boardrooms, and living rooms. He believes strongly in storytelling's innate ability to connect people to their higher purpose and one another. Joseph also serves as the CEO of LMS Voice, an educational consulting and production company, which he started as an opportunity to collaborate with other powerful storytellers and to leverage his years of experience into meaningful social change. LMS Voice focuses on three mediums of narrative disruption, LMS curriculum, an ever-growing and free online curriculum featuring culturally responsive workshops, LMS Storytellers, a space where he offers innovative storytelling practices that create meaning, uh, meaningful transformation fueled by their clients' unique lived experiences, and lastly, LMS Studio, a production company pushing the edges of socially responsible storytelling. LMS Voice provides all three mediums to restore humanity in all the spaces that we occupy. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Green. For my nephew on his 11th birthday, I'm sorry for how incomplete this poem will always be. The sun will come out, just not always tomorrow. At times it will rain for weeks. It will seem like lifetimes. Your uncle has known monsoons. I have faced them straight for you. So when I tell you, like your grandmother told me that this too shall pass, you will know I mean it. You are so cool. Keep that. It is always those who do not care what the world says that cultivate cool. It is always those who do not care what the world says that cultivate cool. Be cooler than me. I ran. Stereotype first into the skewed acceptance of the popular kids. It eventually left me unraveled. I am now proudly all poetry and nerve endings. Be you. It'll be easier in the end. Rebel against two-dimensional standardized test confines. Be bound only by the infinite depths of your mind. Embrace the barbed wire paradox of existence. Inhale, relax, get up, keep moving. Time is coming for you. She is already here. Try not to break anything you love. Most times it'll be unavoidable. When given the option, make love only, make love often. Hate will deplete your God-given reservoirs of optimism and hope. Cynicism is a coward substitute, even when clever. It never builds relationships, only barriers. Ignore everything I said so far in this poem. Or don't. It was always your choice, and it never was. Some will say that everything that happens, happens for a reason. Others will say it is already written. It is all absurd. Happiness and blessings are not seeds planted in fields of what you think you deserve. You will only ever find happiness in the things that you do. Do something greater than yourself. And above all else, find something to believe in. Cameron, it's my nephew's name. We will always be half-winged angels, imperfect and incapable of flight. My angel, jump anyway, dive every day for the possibility of feeling the wind of greatness across your face just once in this life. Love, your Uncle Joe. Clap. It is dangerous, it is dangerously uh, tempting to want to jump from one side of this podium to the other. I was watching the first speaker do it and I'm like, are you gonna stand still? And it was like, no, because the one place you wanna stand still, there's a giant box. So I'm probably gonna do a lot of leaning. Um, my name is Joseph Green and I'm a professional storyteller, which I enjoy saying, but I can still feel my mother cringing at um, as a profession. And uh, I've been working with young people for a very long time. And now I work with all people 
because I realized after a while that if I spent the rest of my life going classroom to classroom, um, I would probably not make it out of Fairfax County in Virginia. And so I wanted to create something that allowed me to teach what I've been seeing and doing in classrooms uh, even before I understood it to be a part of prevention, but now is a part of the prevention programs that I, I help build for different organizations that I like to call wellness because um, I don't like the idea of creating something around the absence of a thing, but having it be about the inclusion of all of those things that we've been talking about all day from the first speaker all the way down, um, the things that are missing, the things that help us cope, the things that help us deal. And so the stories I'm gonna tell you today, they're gonna be in that, in that realm. And you're gonna say, well, what are the learning objectives for this presentation? I'm here listening for an hour and I have a job, a very serious job to do, and I need to know what the learning objectives are. Here they are. Your story matters. No matter a person's background, eventually we have the ability to become the primary authors of our own character and thusly our own future. Sharing your story creates empathy. Empathy creates connection. We are severely lacking connection in the world. When I tell my story, I get to decide what the moral is. I get to decide what I learned from that reflection. It is empowering. That's what I hope you learned today. And now I'm gonna get into it. Are you ready? <laughs> You're not ready. Um, let's just, just be honest. Uh, let's start this way then. Give yourselves a round of applause. Um, hello, friend. Hi. Um, on a scale of F to A, where would you put that round of applause? A solid C. Yeah. I remember being a young kid growing up saying, man, I want to be a solid C. If I pointed at the door and said, uh, coming through the door is a person who has a job that saves lives, right? And they're gonna be wearing a uniform. So police officer, firefighter, EMT, they're gonna come through the door. I said, this person saves lives and you can tell by the uniform that they're wearing. And I say, give that person a round of applause. Oof, blow off this place. I am alive. My father is alive. I have a father. My children have fathers. One father, we have one father. <laughs> um, because of the work of people like you in this room, if you are in the finance office, if you are in the streets and everything in between, we all have a part to play in this. So what you do saves lives. So if I said somebody was coming in this room and they saved lives and give them a round of applause, I'm expecting not a C. So we're gonna try it again in a moment. Give it a, there's always one person who's really enthusiastic about clapping again. Hold on, whoever you are, I know your hands are antsy. I think he's gonna ask us to do it again. Hold on. On the count of three, I want you to give yourself, you, you, yourself, the round of applause that is equal to the value that you add to your community. You ready for it? One, two, three. If you ever want to know what it's like to get a rousing a round of applause, convince a room of people that they're clapping for themselves and have them clap and then just sit back and be like, yeah, that's, that's good. I needed some of that serotonin right there. No. Um, 
Thank you for what you do. This first story. Oh, people say they want to, uh, scientists say that people want to know how these things are going to go. We're going to tell the story. We're going to do a poem. We're going to tell a story. We're going to do a poem, tell the story, do a poem. And then right before I'm finished, I'm going to get a sign that says you have one minute left. Um, and then I'm going to round it up really quick because I'm probably going to go over. And I don't want to go over because you want to go home. First story. I used to be 12. End of story. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm here all week. Uh, when I was 12, uh, I was in middle school, like I imagine many or most of you also were in middle school. And I went to a dance in a room about this size, actually, but it was a cafetorium. And I don't know if you know what a cafetorium is, but it's when your school has like the gym and the cafeteria and the auditorium all in one room. Right. So there's like a little stage to the side and there's a curtain behind it and everyone's trying to get behind the curtain because I don't know what we do behind the curtain, but that's what we try to get behind the curtain. Um, and so everything is pulled back except for the bleachers. So we'll say the bleachers are right there and all the dudes are sitting on the bleachers and there's the table with the food on it. And all the young ladies are gathered around the table with the food. Uh, the teachers are dispersed somewhere. And in the back, there's a DJ table with the DJ playing music that is very inappropriate for the age group. Right but nobody's dancing, right? There's no one dancing. And so I know it's hard to believe looking at me now, but I was not always this suave. <laughs> that back table, you're laughing a little too hard. <laughs> it seems like you believed me. Um, when I was in middle school, I was very small and slender, but my head was this size. So, uh, and so just imagine, right, that that kid, he's very approachable. He's kind, right? He wants to be loved and accepted. And so I was really close friends with all the popular girls because I was easy to talk to. And one of the popular girls wanted to dance. And she looked at me and she pointed at me across the room and said, hey, Joseph, let's dance. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked into the eyes of a person who has the entire universe in them, but there's a gravity to some people. And when they ask you to do something, you forget things about yourself, important things about yourself, like you don't know how to dance. And so here we are in the middle of the dance floor and, and for like two, three minutes, I'm living my best life. Someone asked me like what song was playing and I don't really remember, but for like um, the sake of storytelling, let's say Push It by Salt and Pepper. That's the song that's playing. Just so you have like a soundtrack in your head of what's going on. So that's what we're doing. We're in the middle of the dance floor dancing to Push It by Salt and Pepper. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye that there's somebody laughing. And, you know, maybe they're having a conversation. They couldn't be laughing at me because I'm here in the middle of the floor doing my thing, living my best life. Look out the other corner of my eye. I see another person laughing. And then all the teachers are magically back and they're laughing. And I turn around and I break from this moment and I see that I am in the middle of everybody's middle school nightmare. The entire school is laughing at me. And in very 80s movie montage, I burst out of the cafeteria doors and I don't dance in public again for 10 years. It seems very dramatic when I say it, like people are imagining oh, you don't dance in public. That's not the worst thing that ever happened to a person, but it's the beginning of a thing. It's the beginning of me believing that the world knew what was best for me and trying to fit in to all of those things that I thought I was supposed to be. Reference that first poem that I did. I was trying to be cool and not realizing that I already was. And so I spent my life not putting myself out there. I go to college, I'm a theater major. And if you know anything about us theater folks, we pack together and we take care of each other. And I find this group of people and we go to a dance club in Richmond, Virginia. This is where I'm going to school. And we take over the dance floor every Friday night and we make a circle. And in that circle, everything is okay. In that circle, you're allowed to be your truest self. You don't have to be on rhythm. You don't have to be dancing with anybody else. You don't even have to know the words of the song. You just gotta be authentic. 
You got to be true. You got to be yourself. You got to be unafraid because that's what the wall is. This is us sacrificing so that when we are here together, we can be ourselves. And that's when I started dancing again, when I felt safe, when I felt that there were people that had my back, that when I jumped or leapt or tried something, even if I failed, I was going to be caught by people who also had skin in the game. What I learned from that was that I can create those spaces, that I don't have to hope that they happen, that I can find people with like minds and we can create circles wherever we are, wherever we go. There was one big problem with this particular circle though. We were at a club and our circle was fueled by drugs and alcohol. This is important to mention, especially when talking with young people, because the people that they're hanging out with are their friends and they love them and they protect them and they make them feel like they're part of a group. And so attacking that as itself being a bad thing is a 100% surefire way to get a young person to stop listening to you. Premature enlightenment is what I call it. I found a solution to the pain, to the anxiety, to the undiagnosed mental illness. And it was quick and it was easy and it felt good and it fell apart because it wasn't about us. It was about me and it was about each of them. And as we went on into our lives, some of them got into the workforce, drank normally, have normal lives. And then there was me. And I'm the person that took it too far. When the circle is not about learning how to keep that feeling when you're not with those people, you find yourself alone, disconnected, unattached to society, and it becomes very easy to go too far. 10 years into the future, I find myself in another circle. Only this time, there's no music playing. And in fact, it is in the basement of a church. And I'm sitting there. And once again, the only rule to be in this circle is that you tell your truth. Except you have to listen to it. There's no music to drown it out. There's no drugs to make it easier. And you have to start building those tools that allow you to understand and hear your story. That's why I do the work that I do. I work with young people and communities to create circles so that wherever you go, you can find somebody of like mind and like thought and like spirit and that you are never alone. Many of you will notice when I signed your book, I wrote that you are not alone. My book is a piece of my circle that I'm offering each and every one of you. So that if you ever do find yourself without people, you will never actually be alone. It is the honor of my life to be able to do storytelling as a living, to be in this room and all the rooms that I'm in when I travel and share my life story in a way that may inspire people because I did not come from a family where I was encouraged to share my life story. And we're gonna get into that in one of the poems. We're gonna take a break real quick, not like a physical break, please don't leave, but I wanna tell you something. This is hard work, very hard work. And I almost got out of it. I almost got into vegetables, but the celery was too low. Okay, cool. All right, just making sure you're still with me. Um, I warned you, I said I'm a dad. So yeah, do you say it's terrible? <laughs> it's terrible, <laughs> a terrible joke. Get him off the stage. We pay for that? Are we paying for that joke? Um, I'm going to uh, perform the poem now that was written after that story. And I'm gonna tell you about the workshop that all of this was born from. It's called Dear Me. In a dream, I saw the adolescent version of myself leaning against the wall at a middle school dance. Appearing nervous with our head down, he seemed wanting, if not needing, of some advice. I pulled out a napkin, 
composed a letter, a literal self-help manual, slipped into my own prebubescent hand, looked down and read, Dear Me, Dance. Though you will not be good at it until your early 20s. Bear witness to how solar systems are created within the orbits of thighs, how stars always seem to burn out yet shine on as you two-step through universe. Do not forget to breathe. If she approaches, it was meant to be. If not, Big Dipper or Supernova, you will discover painfully that the wonder behind love is a lot like dancing. I just rewrote the poem for the book. And I want to make sure I give you the right one. The last word I said was dancing. Pretend like that. If she approaches, it was meant to be. If not, Big Dipper or Supernova, you will discover painfully that the wonder behind dancing is a lot like love. It is not solely predicated on the idea that another is always there to do it with you. You will often find that you are doing dancing and loving alone, but don't you dare stop. Dear me, or best friend an imaginary turtle could have. Your imagination is stardust, the stuff of fantasies and fairy tales. Careful, do not get lost in the clouds or blown away by the storm of indecision. There is gravity in your dreams, forces felt but rarely seen like purpose or faith. Allow only truth to propel you. The force is thick, wrought with distraction and danger. Hone your instincts, even after they betrayed you. Our wits, like the blade, are only sharpened through use. Dear me, a future phoenix rising. Addiction and abuse are hidden within the strands of your DNA. For you, there is no such thing as trying drugs. You were raised having never been taught how to heal while giving in to the pain, only how to mask it or avoid it or dump it at the feet of those who have loved you. Abusing substances was never the problem, merely the wrong answer, a poisonous solution that will strip your branches bare causing you to lose things, most of which the universe will never see fit to give you a second chance with, all of which will break your mother's heart. Dear me. The people labeled broken on arrival cannot be safe, merely loved and accepted, as you will one day hope to be. Joseph, put down the blade. Lower the heat in the shower, pins and that tourniquets, paper, a poor band-aid. It will be years before poetry will send word to save you. Stop it now. Your soul will heal long before those scars do. Dear four-eyed oracle, some wounds won't heal magically with mother's kiss. It won't make sense for years to come. This is just a writing exercise. There's no sense in it all. If I could actually give you life and a manuscript, the instructions would simply read, only change the parts where you hurt people. Everything else is miracle. Besides, what's the worst that could happen? You grow up to be me, a shattered but mending, sometimes unemployed, literary freestyle specialist with a vampire's thirst for the universe's lifeblood. And young man, I have loved you all along. Sincerely, Joseph LMS Green. Show of hands, how many people in here are scared of public speaking? Okay, cool, hands down. So the worst thing that could possibly happen when doing public speaking is like you forget what you're supposed to be saying, right? Um, and I just want to take out and have a facilitation like real life moment. Like I literally forgot my poem that I wrote like a decade ago and am being paid to be here to recite. Um, and I wanted just to share the human part of that moment. Uh, it's not, the delivery is the message. Um, and if you have a message, if you have a story, if you have something that you need to share with the world, don't focus on being the best storyteller. Focus on being the best truth teller, right? Yeah, give that a round of applause. I was the president of the Youth Alcohol Prevention uh, YADAP, Youth Alcohol Drug Abuse Prevention Program in my high school. And I don't know what YADAP has become, but I remember what it was. When I was in high school, I was taught to fear 
taking drugs. And I was taught to look down on, not the exact language, but people who use drugs. And I didn't use a drug or substance until I was in college, which in high school made me an extraordinarily popular person. All the parties, first guy to get invited, right here. Where did that come from? Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, that joke never gets more than four laughs, but I'm not gonna stop telling it, ever. Um, but what they didn't know was that at home, my father was an alcoholic. And I didn't know how to make the two of those things reconcile. The man who I'm supposed to listen to, the man who I'm supposed to trust, uh, the man who I'm supposed to learn how to be a man from, is what I am being taught is bad, that he's choosing. And if he was just strong enough willed or just loved me enough or cared enough about his own life that he could just break out of it. And so therefore there must be something wrong with me and my brother and my mother. When I was 16, my father was arrested for his second DUI. My mother took me to jail to pick him up. In this moment, she was trying to jar him and it worked. My father got into recovery. It did the exact opposite for me. I began to hate my father. When you see Superman come out of a jail with his cape all in straps and his shirt untucked and his belt and his pants are soiled and, and he gets in the car and you see him cry and you're not the type of family that cries. In fact, when you cried when you were young, you were told to stop crying. When you see that, it becomes a trauma that lives with you. And if you don't have the means with which to deal with that trauma, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Two years, we lived in the same household. My father was in recovery. He never sat me down and told me a story. Never sat me down and told me what he was going through. Never told me about the history of our family that his father dealt with this disease and my mother's father dealt with this disease and my brother who was six years older than me was in the military dealing with this disease. Oh yeah, matter of fact, every member of my immediate family is military, just to put some more context on how much we don't talk about feelings and how much we drink to get away from them, just to put that context there. Um, and so I go off to college and I'm like a big deal in my college. I got drafted into a theater program. Um, definitely not that, that guy, that guy and his speltness and sports playing, that was not me, but I could talk well and I could act and I get into a school and I was a big deal and I got into all the plays my first year and I didn't know what to do with the stress. But my professor smoked weed and people were smoking cigarettes and drinking and going to parties. And these successful people who had the lives that I wanted to have were doing drugs. That's how they were dealing with their pain. When my father or mother were stressed, they dealt with their pain by having a drink. They celebrated by having a drink. They, I don't know, went to bed by having a drink. Like it was just the thing that you did. It was never just the activity for the sake of the activity. It was always the activity and a drink. And so that's what I started doing. And then a drink became a smoke became a line, became what we would call the proverbial rock bottom. A man was talented and was doing well, but felt so empty and kept trying to fill himself with these artificial means of joy, with this premature enlightenment that you just kept needing to do more and more and more and more and then the art doesn't matter anymore and the poems don't matter anymore and the auditions stop mattering and you're lost. This poem that I'm gonna share now is for my father because this work and the work that you all do and my learning how to express my feelings through art when I got into recovery was the same tools I was able to bring home to my family to heal the generations of trauma. Now, my son, who is nine, my oldest son, who is nine, um, if I had done my presentation with the slides, the first slide is a picture that he drew this summer and he loves Basquiat. And so he does a lot of text in his things. And the, the, the text 
in this particular piece was, um, there's no such thing as evil, just misguided. And I was sharing last night at uh, Penn Foundation and a realization that I had just made in that moment and I wanna share with you all today is when we are able to use our stories to destroy that generational shame about talking about mental health, about talking about substance use disorder. It's not just about your kids being able to look up to you and you to be forgiven for the things that you've done. I now know that my son believes this about himself also. And so when that inevitable storm comes and it will come, I have no expectation that my son will never do drugs. I have no expectation that he will not ex do, uh, fall into escapism at some point because life is hard and his life may be harder than mine no matter what I do to shield him. But those protective factors that we are learned to talk, teach when we're in prevention programs or when we're in recovery programs, they're meant to strengthen us so that we can stay strong against those winds. And I know now that he has one of the most important ones and that's the ability to understand who he is as separate from some of the actions that he may do, and that there's always a chance for redemption. It took me 10 years to go back home because I didn't believe that my parents believed in redemption, and I sure didn't for my own self. My father has Alzheimer's now, and I do this poem, and it gets me very emotional, but it's important for me to remember him and me at this space in our lives and to honor that and to also say to the folks who don't have the opportunity to make things right, that if the universe is to ever to extract the remaining usefulness from us, forgiveness has to be an olive branch we eventually extend ourselves. So as we do this work, we might not be able to go back and make all the things right or we're working with our clients and we realize that they don't have the ability to go back and make things right. It doesn't mean that they are not deserving of forgiveness themselves. And that's how we get back into the world and we can use this energy and transform it into something that can make the world a better place. It's not part of my speech today, but I hope that it touched somebody. This poem is called, Life is Short. Will you do me a favor, front row? Amy, right? Yeah. Um, first of all, loved your thing, and I wanted to shout and clap when you said the thing about harm reduction, but I was too busy signing books, but I just, I'm happy that you put that in there. It's very important to me. Um, uh, when I'm done with this poem, can you remind me to tell everybody about the workshop that the poems were created that I was supposed to do after the last one? Yeah, I mean, and you can just pretend like no one else can hear us and just yell pause, and then I'll, cool? All right, because I want to make sure I get to that. Um, front row, how you feeling? I'm curious about who's considering themselves front row. Front row, how you feeling? All right, just nodding, good. He's not going to clap. He's not going to clap. Uh, second row, we're still feeling good? I'm going to be honest. First row, second row made you look bad. Uh, third row, how are we doing? Okay, see, now, yeah, they understand the assignment. Last row, how's it feel? Last row, I'm going to say you probably were kind of helped out by your anchor there. There's a lot of high pitch like volume coming from that angle right there, and I appreciate it. And now a very sad poem. No, I'm joking. I'm not. It is sad, but we'll get over it. Here we go. Life is short. In the hospital bed, I helped him turn so the cancer medication could spread more evenly. His eyes welled and cracked like a fortune cookie. The piece of paper inside read, life is short, but being alive is the longest thing you will ever do. Proceed accordingly. If I'd attempted this homage to my father 20 years ago, it probably would have consisted more of those intangibles that drove me away, hate, and blame more than just mere symptoms of childhood angst, but the language I learned to speak in effort to explain how my father's absence from my formative years made me feel. You see, I once considered my father's DNA to be a cancer in me. Understanding the helix to be doubled, I never dreamed of losing myself completely, only half. A man now, I realized my thinking was the cancer. Forgiveness is medication, so waiting for it to spread evenly. 
always with the wrong bottle in hand from birth. My father showed me the image of addict. It resembles something like a court jester juggling knives, one blade for family, one blade for work, one for the military that never treated him as equal, another for the father that died when he was 10, another for the mother that was never the same, all the while spiraling down towards the greatest come to Jesus moment ever. 16 year old son in the back seat as wife picks him up from jail after his second DUI. My father's been in recovery now for over 30 years. His poison was alcohol. Mine was cocaine. They say parents want children to grow up, achieve feats greater than their own. I don't believe this is what they had in mind. I spent years mortified of mirrors for having his image projected back on me. I saw the new likeness at the bottom of empty whiskey bottles and clear plastic baggies. I mainline hate and blame until I became so high. I had nowhere to go. Rock bottom in the sky. I landed in my father's arms. Through falling, I've come to realize that just as he did not, I did not ask for this predilection towards addiction. That hate and blame are just new ways to get high for those of us not willing to change. And that which took him over half a lifetime only took me 10 years because he has shown me what recovery looks like, what redemption looks like, what a life no longer lived in regret looks like. I refuse to be another cautionary tale of a son who couldn't forgive his father because he didn't have the courage to forgive himself. Racing down Route 95, a bat out of a homemade hell, stopped by a cop for going 95, exclaiming out of the window of my car that like all men, my father's dying. Like most men, I never told him I understood. Never told him I forgive them as I hope he had forgiven me. Never said, I realized one of those blades you juggled had love for family inscribed in it. Never said, though I realized neither side of this reflection will ever be perfect. I am no longer scared of mirrors. Because life is short, but being alive, the longest thing you will ever do, proceed accordingly. Oh, no. <laughs> no. That wasn't a call for more clapping. That was like, oh, I didn't have to say clap that time. Um, I was really excited about that. Uh, but I think I had ringers. I had people who heard the poem last night and they knew that it was over. It's like, oh, let's, let's join in. Um, I appreciate you. So I have this thing I want to tell you about that I totally remembered on my own. Um, you know what's so wicked about it? I totally wasn't going to say anything about it. I was just going to go into the next story. Um, so there's a book that this organization has had uh, the benevolent, fortuitous insight. I don't know if those words work together, but it feels good, and I'm a poet, so I'm going to do what I want, um, to purchase these books so that you can have them. This book is not published yet. I am not done with this book. Um, in fact, I just saw um, a, a, a little error in the book that's going to eat at me forever and ever. And if you find it, um, call me. I'll send you a dollar. Um, but next month, there's going to be a curriculum online that goes with the three poems that are in the book. Um, I've done two of them so far, and I'm going to end with one in a moment. Um, the first poem that I did, Dear Me, was a very simple workshop that I was doing with um, high school students where I was asking them to imagine themselves in 30 years, right? We've done this exercise. And then I realized that at the point that I did it, that like I didn't want to look 30 years ahead. Um, I wanted to, to look back because I understand that there are parts of me that I hadn't addressed yet, even through therapy, even through recovery. And so I was able to look back at those parts of myself and, and have some catharsis in the writing process. So it was very literally the question, like what would I say to my 12 year old self if he was sitting in front of me right now? Um, there's another form of this exercise that I, I invite you all to try and it will be a part of the curriculum, which is where we get to go back with our language now, with our tools, with our big words and our understanding of the human psyche and have a conversation with the people who took care of us. What would you say to that person that your young self was trying to say, but didn't have the words to do, or didn't have the space to do. 
Like I wasn't asked about my emotions and my feelings. I was just told how to be. And my young self, my acting out, and many of the young people that we deal with, the things that we label as acting out are quite literally just saying, I need something and I'm not getting it. So what is that person trying to say? And when I first did that exercise, first I wept. And then I imagined the times where I told my son, my oldest son, without explaining to him why we were doing what we were doing, what he needed to do, and how disempowering it would be. What's the opposite of empowering? Disempowering? Did I get that right? Look at me. <laughs> Community college and all. Um, and so I want to offer these small things to you. Our website also has about 100 pieces of free uh, creative writing curriculum that you can access right now. Um, because that's the lane that I lived in for many, many years, giving young people an opportunity to express themselves, giving them the autonomy of being able to share their story in a way that made them feel good about it and gave them ownership over it. Well, again, I, will, I keep saying this term protective factors because I know it's a thing that we all recognize in here. I didn't know that's what I was doing before I was even doing it. Like there's so many things that we have, so many tools that we already have that we can employ to give young people the ability to know why they're saying no. You can tell them to say no. We saw how well that went. When you are hurting and somebody puts something in front of you that says it's gonna make you feel better, you're gonna try it. You're gonna hope that you're not one of the people that die of that real dangerous thing they keep talking about fentanyl, but if you don't have a reason to say no, you won't. These are reasons for us to say no. I understand what I'm grateful for. I know what I've been through. My life has value. I get to share it with people on a regular basis, whether it's through drawing or storytelling verbally or through uh, social media, through making films and things of that sort, which many of us don't understand, but I started a production company so I would be able to understand. And now we're teaching young people how to record their lives in a way that they can share with other folks that is empowering to it, that gives them accountability in a completely different way and allows us to connect with them because 30, 40 years in between is a long, long time. Um, I'm gonna ask real quick so that you don't have to tell me, how much time do I have left? So, five, okay. Here's the last poem and the last story. And then you can ask me a whole bunch of questions, okay? Like 30 questions. Also, I'm gonna be here until all of the books that you want have been signed and given to you. So I'm not going anywhere until that's done. So don't think that I'm gonna run off stage. I'll be back there. All right. Um, this last story is about how poetry saved my life, which is where this whole thing was going. And I say that to people and then they say, oh, that seems like a thing that you just say to people, like poetry saved my life. But poetry literally saved my life. I was living in upstate New York at the height of my um, active use. And when I hit that rock bottom in the sky, I was able to go back home to my father who was in recovery and helped me get into recovery. But I had a friend, close friend, his name was John. And um, he was in one of those circles with me, but he was going farther down that rabbit hole. And he didn't have the support services that I had. And I didn't know how to say anything to him because my life was a mess. So how could I tell him about his life? And so I left town and I didn't say anything to John because I was waiting to get perfect. A year into my recovery, I get a phone call. John has died by suicide, by overdose. I get in my car and I drive back to New York. There's a line of poetry in my head. And this is relevant because there hadn't been any poetry since I got into recovery. The last time I saw you alive, the last time I saw you alive, I get up to the funeral and as is a tradition in our community, when one of us passes, we mourn that person's death by doing more of what killed them because we haven't gained the tools yet. But I had a few tools that I'd gained for my year in recovery. And so I knew that if I had tried to do the amount of drugs equal to the hole that I was feeling inside of me, I would have died that night because my body had reset and there would have been no stopping point because there's no way to make that pain go away. So I chose to go back to the hotel and that's where I wrote this poem. And when I say poetry saved my life, that's what I mean. And when I say you should find your poetry, I don't mean to pick up a pen, there are enough poets, unless you wanna be one. 
I mean find your poetry, that thing that's there for you when nothing else is working, that you can go to as that next right step until you can figure out or get in touch with somebody that can help you with what you're feeling inside because you're not alone. You shouldn't face that alone. This poem is called Talk Ugly. That line of poetry that was in my head, the last time I saw you alive, I wish I would have talked ugly to you. Said, put the straw down. No, I don't want to take another line. I should be writing them. My friend, you are a creator of music and magic. Instruct your limbs to serve a purpose greater than self-indulgence. Do not be fooled into thinking your pain has sharper teeth than anyone else's. I had a chance, said nothing because I was high. This is how I got started. A bottle of Jack and a mirror, memories and scissors, dreams drenched in ether, sliced by razors, potential roll like $20 bills, numbing the feeling on the tip of my tongue that I or this tongue should be serving a greater purpose. In the last ditch attempt at self-assessment, I decided to look at my life through the eyes of loved ones for they see everything, especially the ugly. From years of drug use, from lying with to lying to angels, friends I had forsaken, taking so much more than I had given, I had streamlined self-centeredness into a science. But there was a righteousness there, a willingness to craft this illness through alchemy and poetry into a seer stone. But honestly, how could I speak ugly to you when I was yet to speak it to myself? In these nightmares of hindsight, there is no poetry. No alliterations to soften the blow. Some realities have no simile. Truth is like truth. How could I form my lips to call your suicide a tragedy when I left you alone in that room, kept company by narcotics and a thousand ghosts draped in your disappointments? I can only imagine all the voices you heard, all but mine. Smear makeup onto disgust if you must. Trust the truth is seldom pretty, but she is always beautiful. It is in times like these that I need you to please talk ugly to me. My pain needs it. Too many times we caress sadness when it needs to be shaken, torn from its place of comfort, forced to grow wings to survive. Don't just tell me I can grow up and be whatever I want. Tell me that whatever I want better be something I am willing to achieve, that dreams will dissipate under the weight of addiction and that there is a distinct difference between living like a rock star and actually being one. Sometimes, no matter how many poems you've written, you'll feel like nothing more than a cokehead and a poser. Fear not. We are all divinely flawed individuals, perfectly ugly. There's no point hiding behind pretty lies. We are the sum of the scars that hold together the remainder of our pretty pieces. The last time I saw you alive, the last time I saw you alive, the last time I saw you alive, I wish I would have talked ugly to you. It would have been the most beautiful thing I never said. Thank you. As, as the, the mic is going up for questions, I'll say one last thing about that poem, just to be very clear. Um, when I teach that poem or when I share it with young people, and this will be a part of the curriculum also, I make it very clear that if somebody in your life hurts themselves, that you are never at fault. That poem was a part of me learning that lesson and that I know there are people who have said absolutely everything that they could say and the result still ended up unfavorable. That poem is not about finding the right combination. It's about realizing that if you wait until you're perfect to say something that needs to be said, you're going to be silent for the rest of your life. So if you have somebody in your life and there's something you need to say, say it. It may be messy. And then find a way to get support for you and that person. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> that he Joseph, you are everything and then some. I heard so many good things. That was that was really, really inspiring. So I have a couple of questions I got from the hub. So these are coming from students that I really like to just do a couple of these first. So one of them was, um, where do you find the courage to share your, your truth with strangers? Mm, yeah. Um, I 
there will come a point where what you have to say becomes greater than your fear of saying it, right? I don't know what that point is for everybody, but for me, it was going, being invited to a, a, a after school foster care program and um, because of that poem that I just did and the teacher wanting me to talk to the young people and me realizing that for the first time that my story had greater value than getting people to clap for me, right? Um, and then I realized that when I was at my worst point, when I was in upstate New York, in that room, there was an album that I kept on repeat and how that music was a buoy for me and that those people had to be unafraid to share their truth in that form for me to have something to hold on to. So at some point I realized the value was greater than my anxiety disorder, was greater than my depression and greater than my family's very strong desire not to put any of our business out there. Um, and I have been rewarded for it. And I feel like if you go into it with uh, honesty and truth, um, which is the same thing, uh, you will also be rewarded for it. But make sure you're ready, right? Sometimes we confuse courage um, with uh, a need to escape a feeling that we're having. And so we run into the public eye or sharing our story as another drug to, to keep the emotion. So make sure that you're ready and you'll know when you do it and have someone there who loves you and doesn't care how it goes to support you when you do it. Thank you. Thank you. The one more from the kids. Did you, <laughs> did you ever get to hear your father's story? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's funny about that poem, the, 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 I get this often. People think that my father's passed away because of the way the poem is put into time. Um, and I memorized it that way, so I'm never going to change it. But um, before my father fell into his Alzheimer's, yes, um, we had a good 20 year run um, from that moment where I came home to when um, he he's to the point now where he doesn't have the, his speech facilities anymore, faculties anymore. Um, but yeah, we, we were able to speak. Um, I learned about my family. Um, I learned about my grandfather who I'd never met because he died when my dad was 10, um, as much as, excuse me, as much as he could remember. And I feel very, very blessed to have done so, which again is another thing when I do that poem, I do it so that if there is a chance that you go and you call that person, I don't know who they are for you, but you go and you do it. And that's another reason why we do what we do. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have questions in the room? Oh, come on. Some, one person like, hey, where'd you get that t-shirt at? Or yeah. something, okay. geez, Louise. I, I hope y'all never have to do this where you get on stage and someone said, you have any questions? And they're like, nothing. Um, so while you're up there, I already talked to you a little bit and I did send my partner some of the things that you were, say, uh, you were saying and everything. And I just wanted to let you know that they did ugly cry after. Um, and do you have any words for them as someone who is only, they've been sober around three years, they're um, amazing artists, but because of their addiction, you know, got away to them and they're getting back into it and they're finally, sorry if I tear up, <laughs> they're finally talking about their addiction and getting out there and I don't know if you have any words of encouragement for them to not be held back just because of how deep and dark some of the material can be. Yeah, um, balance. Uh, I, I curate my vibe, right? I, I do these poems here. This is my job. I do not do this every day, right? I couldn't stand to do it every day. Um, I also listen to a lot of uh, trap music. Um, and that's because I'm not really there for the words. I'm there for the vibe, for the energy, right? Like you have to have a balance of this super deepness and like the frivolous fun that like makes us happy, whatever that may be for you. Maybe knitting and maybe trap music. I don't know what their vibe is, but um, make sure that that is a, as integral part of their existence as doing this deep work because it's serious, but it ain't that serious. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome so much. Any other questions? I got one in the front. Oh, there she is. Hello. Hey. Um, have you talked about the young lady at the dance very lovingly? Have you ever got a chance to talk to her? <laughs> or is she a part of your life? Just oh, so man. You so very lovingly of her. Yeah. So I know her. Yeah, no, I know exactly where she is. Um, thank you, Facebook. Uh, um, 
I have never shared the two reasons why I've never like been like, hey, this is you. Yeah. Um, one, because I'm not 100% sure of all of the facts of that story, right? Yeah. And I also don't want her to make her think that she was like the catalyst for like the worst thing that like that happened to me in middle school. But um, no, we're friends and she knows that this is what I do for a living. She's, um, she's she, actually, she does uh, physical training and she keeps sending me text messages asking me when I'm coming back to the gym. So um, yeah, but I've never been like, hey, this is you. In fact, in the book, the drawing looks nothing like her on purpose. <laughs> Cause I was like reflecting on my middle school experiences and having a little trauma moment. And I was like, you think about those people years of past and how they are connected. And it seemed like you had a fond affection for her. So yeah, I like do. And I mean, I actually, I, 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 this is why I enjoy Facebook because there are a lot of people in my life that I could have written off, but I've seen their journey now. And then, you know, and what they've been through and when they've lost or what they've gone through having children and the seeing the tone of their like message and their, their, their humanity change. Um, uh, I, 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 I love that part of it. It allows me to do some healing without necessarily having, you know, have an intervention with my bully. <laughs> um, if you have questions that you don't want to ask in front of all the people, I'll be back there. Um, do me a favor. I just want to say this because there's going to be a line um, because I need to sign the books if you want them signed. Um, there's a QR code on my computer screen. If you want to have a longer conversation, I invite that. Hit the QR. It'll get my, you'll get my email address and so on and so forth. Shoot, hit me up uh, and we'll, we'll put something on a calendar to, to Zoom or have a conversation. Um, it's just so that we can try to get through folks. Uh, thank you to the folks who thought to bring me to this space. Um, I had a wonderful time. Thank you to Penn Foundation for inviting me to your facility yesterday. I had an amazing time. Um, and yeah, uh, I will. Thank you. Yeah.